It's 3 p.m. live from our studio here in New York City. I'm Josh Lipton alongside Jared Blickery today. This is Yahoo Finance Live. Here's what we're watching this afternoon. We are now an hour away from the closing bell on Wall Street. The S&P 500 hitting a new all-time high for the first time in two years. Stronger than expected consumer sentiment data lifting markets as inflation expectations fall to a three-year low. And guess what? Tech stocks are leading the way on Wall Street. We've got to look at some of the top trending tickers. This includes NVIDIA, which is hitting an all-time high. But for one analyst, NVIDIA is no longer his top pick. We're going to tell you what is replacing it ahead. Plus, we'll get you ready for a busy week of earnings next week. Netflix among the key names to watch. You have everything you need to know to make moves in your portfolio. All right, let's get you up to speed on the market action. And I'm tracking the S&P 500 on the Wi-Fi Interactive. That's right, finally hit that record high two years in the making. And let's just pull that up. We can see we're sitting on gains of 1.717%. And here's that three-year chart. Here's the high that we had to beat and finally did it today, this big soup bowl. Uh, we've seen a lot of charts like this. We'll have to track some of the others, like the semiconductor space that are mimicking those patterns that have already taken off. But we also want to take a look at the Dow. And today, that that is up about 404 points. Also checking in on the Treasury market right here. We have seen yields on the rise, and we can see they're just up another fraction of a basis point today, but not too much in that department. Now we want to check on some of our mega cap friends in the NASDAQ 100, and that is a lot of green, hardly any red in the NASDAQ 100. You can see NVIDIA up to another record, up 3.5%. Meta, uh, I believe it's on pace for a record close. That would be the first in years itself. Apple up 1.5%. Tesla barely in the green. It's been struggling this year, but semiconductors, semiconductors really taking a lot of the thunder today. We talked about Broadcom, NVIDIA. Here's AMD. That's up 5% as well. Intel up 3.5%, Josh. All right, Jay, you know what else we have to talk about? Consumer sentiment, yes. my friend. Let's talk about that today because the data is in and Americans feeling way better about the economy. Consumer sentiment jumping in January, hitting its highest mark since July 2021, according to the latest University of Michigan survey. Year ahead, inflation expectations extending declines from December, cooling to 2.9%. That is the lowest reading since no December 2020. So how are our friends and neighbors feeling about the economy? That's what this report tells us here. And this is the University of Michigan preliminary January consumer sentiment report. So the headline there jumps to 78.8, best reading since the summer of 2021. Looks like the big driver there, Jared, was inflation, mm -hmm. this feeling that inflation is, yeah. has turned the corner, right? So year ahead inflation expectations slid to 2.9%. That's the lowest since December 2020. Strategist Peter Bootfar also saying that the expectation the Fed is gonna start cutting rates, in his opinion, also helping to kind of lift confidence too. Yeah, you know, the headline number jumped quite a bit, Josh, but I think what's really capturing uh, some investors' imagination here is that inflation expectation with a two-handle, 2.9%. Haven't seen that in a long time. Also, I have a chart prepared real quick that just shows consumer uh, sentiment is tracking uh, the U.S. financial cr conditions, which have really exploded over the last three months. But when you look at these two time series overlaid, you wouldn't necessarily put this together, but consumer sentiment and the easing of financial conditions are both going up at the same time. You can see they both troughed at the same time in that chart. So uh, a little bit of leading action there for you. And I guess investors look at this, Jared, and think, okay, lower inflation expectations maybe helps them to convince them that Jay Powell and our central bankers are, are going to cut sooner, right? Yeah, but there's been some disagreement about that with For the sure. investor. So uh, let's talk about that with yeah, a, a friend right. of ours next. Yeah, yeah a very good friend. <laughs> Close colleague. Americans feeling better about the state of the economy. So does that mean the vibe session has come to an end? Well, Josh Schaefer is here with a closer look. Joshua. I'm kind of sad we're going to get rid of the word vibe session. I don't know about you two Says guys. Who? But I, it was one of my favorite things of the last year to, I guess, give a little bit of a definition on that, right? Basically, the theory was while the economy never went into a recession, the vibes kind of felt like we were in a recession. And you can sort of see that all over different indicators, including that University of Michigan Consumer Sentiment Index that was out. When you just take a look at that broad chart that we have for consumer sentiment, it had been down significantly low since the pandemic. 
you can see after 2020, it actually took further legs lower, the overall sentiment index. We got a 29% jump, guys, in the last two months alone. That was the biggest combined jump we've seen in two months since 1991. So for a massive, massive rally to happen like that, really, what are people feeling? And they're starting to feel the better parts of the economy, right? They're feeling inflation coming down, as you guys mentioned, off the top of those expectations. They're still spending money. Take a look at retail sales in December, yeah. still coming in better than people expect. Fourth quarter GDP right now expected to be about 2%, a sign of growth overall in the economy. So it seems like consumers starting to pick up on the fact that this economic data, well, they were told coming into 23, mm. it wasn't going to be good. It wasn't actually bad in 2023, and people are starting to sort of realize that. I think. You just have to, uh, it's, it's opposite year, always, right. at the beginning of the year. <laughs> That's all you have to know. Uh, but seriously, uh, when we talk about the Federal Reserve and all of this data interplay, um, there is a lot of talk about the rate cuts. And I, I kind of alluded to the fact that the market isn't pricing in as steep a rate cut, uh, even that first rate cut, as we thought only a week or a month ago. Yeah, we're having stocks at a record high right now, right? Which, of course, brings up something like consumer sentiment. And I think the rally we saw in the last two months helps that. But when you think about the rate cut discussion, Jared, one of the arguments would be, well, if good economic data is making people feel good about the economy, wouldn't good economic data also mean the Fed shouldn't cut because they need they need to be more restrictive? And I thought... Uh, Jan Hansius over at Goldman Sachs had a great answer to this question when he spoke to our team over in Davos. So I want to take a listen to what he had to say. The driver of rate cuts in our forecast, and I would say in what Chair Powell said in the December press conference, is that inflation is coming back down to the target. If inflation comes back down to the target, there will very likely also be rate cuts because a five and three eighths federal funds rate is going to just seem very, very high relative to an economy that's producing a 2% inflation rate. So Jan, really highlighting there that the reason the Fed would cut for a team like Goldman, who sees the economy growing in 2024, would just be inflation coming down. And so the key thing to watch would be something like the PCE, PCE index that we're getting next week and not necessarily how strong the economic data is. The strong economic data is just going to give us that soft landing. Yeah. There was some economists, I want to get your take on this too. They were sort of, here's how they were kind of framing it. They were mm -hmm. saying, if going back to consumer sentiment, if the mm -hmm. index was you know, around 100 or near 100 mm -hmm. in early 2020, then you look at 78.8 and it's a good, it's a better number, but it doesn't really indicate they would say like, you know, dancing bears and rainbows. It's, it's, they were kind of framing it as, it's just less pessimistic. Yeah, well, I think overall, I mean, think about what economists are saying and still, if we want to talk vibes, yeah. the vibe coming into 24, right? It's not like the clear call for this year is all of a sudden, we're gonna have robust growth. You know, it's gonna be a big year for the economy. Most people, the consensus sort of call is basically m gradual growth, not great growth. Not necessarily a recession, but not something that you, we're going to be roaring about either. So I think the consumer sentiment index still reflecting that a little bit, that while yeah. we might not be set up to fully go into a recession, depending on who you ask, we're also not expecting massive growth. And then a no landing is the upside right. scenario that actually is not great for the Fed. So there you go. <laughs> All right. Plenty to discuss, as always. Yes. For sure. Thank you, Josh. Appreciate it. This week, the big banks finished reporting earnings results, and now big tech is on deck. Our next guest thinks the market may be a bit too optimistic about earnings growth this year. Joining us now is Keith Gangle, Gradient Investments Portfolio Manager. Keith, it is good to see you. So maybe we'll just start with the news today. You know, the S&P 500, Keith, rose to an all-time high this afternoon. So I'm curious, as you look out, you know, 2024, you know, in December 2024, Keith, where do you think the SPX, the S&P 500 is? is? Is it higher, lower, or about the same? We think it's higher. It's going to be a grind to get there. We think at the end of the year, it's going to be more of a normalized return, like that's 7 to 10 percent. So obviously, compared to last year, that will be a little bit less. But I think it's going to kind of, those first three weeks, kind of what the market's going to be. It's going to be a grind. When I was talking to people the last few days asking, where do you think the market is, you know, year to date? Most people are, oh, the market's down, you know, 2%. In actuality, it was flat to slightly up. I think that's what the year is going to be. I think it's going to be a good year, but it's going to be a grind to get there. And earnings will be the driver. When you mentioned that I think earnings is a little bit too high, I think estimates are for 12% earnings growth. I think that's too high. I think it's going to be that 7 to 10% range. And if it's in 7 to 10% range, I think that'll be well enough for a tailwind for the overall market to grind higher. But it's going to be fits and starts. I think it's going to be a lot like we've seen those first three weeks. 
And Keith, there was a lot of excitement at the last press, press conference. Uh, people called it the Powell pivot. Whether or not you believe that, uh, I just want to get to the heart of the matter that rate cuts were getting priced in aggressively, uh, over 80 percent chance in March, and that has now dwindled, dwindled to less than 50 percent. What do you think happens, and then how do you think the market prices that? Yeah, you're exactly right. And that's kind of what the last little lift off in the end of year was with the Fed expectation that we started seeing a cut, right? Money gets easier. Stock market traditionally does well. I think people got a little too excited on that. I think that 80 percent is down to, like you said, 50 percent. I actually think it's probably closer to zero. I don't think the Fed needs to start cutting yet. But on the flip side, I didn't think the Fed needed to raise the last couple of rates. So I think now they're in the done. We're not raising rates anymore, which is fantastic for the overall stock market. The question is, when will they start cutting? I think that cutting will happen later in the year. So I do think they cut, but it won't be as soon as what people want and maybe hope. So maybe that could be a little bit of a disappointment here in the next few weeks. We'll see. But I do think earnings will be the key driver and we'll see a lot more earnings reports in the next two weeks. And, and Keith, as the S&P 500 rises to this all time high here in today's trade, how does valuation look to you? Yeah, valuation is full. So that's one thing I worry about. So that's why we need to see that market grow, you know, 12 percent. EPS growth would be fantastic. I think it's more like that seven to ten percent return, and that's where you can get that you know market going up with it. I don't think you're going to see valuation increase at all. So, we think the magnificent seven would kind of hangs in there. Everybody's expecting some kind of you know selling of that group and get you know wider in the market. We think that could happen, but we also still like those names as well. In, in terms of sectors, I'd like to get your take on what you like in the market right now. I know you have some retail names and some healthcare names. I just throw out that McDonald's just hit an intraday record high, first time in months. Um, so we are seeing uh, some price improvement on some of these names. Yeah, those are two sectors that we like a lot this year. Consumers, kind of, that's kind of an out of consensus call right now. Again, everybody's kind of a little bit nervous going in this year in the consumer. We had a great year last year. but. One of the reasons we like the consumer is unemployment rate. Unemployment's at 3.7%. When the U.S. consumer has money in their pocket, when they're working, they love to spend, and they'll spend on, on retail names. That's why we like it. McDonald's was a recent purchase. We did it last fall when the market, when it was selling off. It was selling off a little bit due to the GLP drugs that everybody's worried that, that these things would cure everything, you know, overweight, people would eat out less. McDonald's was certainly in the crosshairs. We think that was a little bit overblown, so that's the reason we actually added McDonald's, and now it's had a nice move on to the upside. And I know another name you like, Keith. You, you see some some opportunity in the healthcare sector, uh, specifically UNH, United Health. What, why is that a buy, in your opinion? We like United Health. It's a long-term compound grower. It's a fantastic company. They just reported last week, and it was actually a great quarter on EPS and revenue, but the stock was actually down, and the reason it was down because of the costs were a little bit higher, which gets the number is the MLR number people look at. They're expecting an 82% number. It came in at 83%. Higher numbers is negative for the MLR. So when that goes up, stock reacted negatively to it. We think that's a buying opportunity. We'd like this name long-term going forward. And we think this name's gonna grow in at you know, 18 to 22%. You're paying a 16 multiple. So these are kind of names we like to buy when they go on sale, especially after this quarter. It wasn't that bad. They actually beat and raised numbers. So we think when people take a step back, this is a good name to be buying at these levels. And Keith, all of this ties into, in the backdrop, we got the bond market and the foreign currency market. And the trend this year, and it's only been a half a month, but the trend in rates has been up. The trend in the U.S. dollar has been stronger. How does this fit into your view? Yeah, that'll be a little bit of a headwind. We'll see. We think, obviously, I think why the rates are backing up is the expectation that the Fed won't be cutting as much or as soon as what some people thought. I think that's what we're seeing a little bit of backup. The economy remains strong. I think that, you know, that, 10-year yield is going to remain at, you know, four, almost four, 415. That could go up to four and a quarter, maybe four and a half. I don't think so. I think, you know, the first half of the year, it means around 4%. We go out throughout the year. I think by year end, it's going to be more like that three and a half percent. And that's going to be more normalized for a long term. We're not used to it. If you look at the last decade, we want, you know, 0% rate was fantastic for the overall markets. But the markets can do very well with at three and a half percent interest rates. And Keith, I want to get you out of here on this. You know, there was this, uh, this interesting piece in the journal this week, Keith. It made, made some headlines, got some attention. They were kind of talking about just the big pile of money sitting on the sidelines, Keith. By their math, I think it was a, around $8.8 trillion in money markets and CDs. Should investors think of that too, Keith? Is that a potential tailwind, in your opinion, for the stock market this year? Or no, that's, you know, that's overstated. Don't, don't bet on that money moving into equity funds. 
somewhere in between there. I don't think that's a big catalyst, but I do think that's a cushion, right? People are moving their money from their CD rates where they weren't making anything or their bank's rates into this money market. And that's where you see that $8 trillion. I do think if people start seeing this market run up again, some of that money will move in and chase the market. So that will probably be the last leg of a nice kind of bull run here in the this course of this next couple of years. But I don't certainly see that $8 trillion coming in to support the overall stock market, but certainly some of it will. So again, I wouldn't get too overly excited, but it is a nice cushion to have there. If the do markets do dip, we'll recommend to our advisors and clients they actually use that money in the money markets to actually buy its stocks to help support them. All right, Keith, listen, thank you so much for joining the show today. Appreciate the insight in those stock picks. Thank you. Now, checking in on some trending tickers in today's trades. We count down here to the closing bell. Let's start off with shares of Super Microcomputer higher today after the company raised Q2 guidance. The company now expects to report more than $3.6 billion in revenue. That's well above the previous forecast of about $2.9 billion. So this one, Jared, well in the green in today's trade. These are preliminary financial results, and investors mm -hmm. clearly like what they saw, beat expectations. The computer hardware maker is saying it expects to beat that previous forecast. Now, they're not saying preliminary adjusted EPS, by the way, 540 to 555. Consensus was, consensus was closer to 455 there. Yeah, um, it, just another bullish win for the AI trade here. If there's anything negative, uh, might be, if you do the math on the updated EPS guidance, uh, gross margin might actually be declining. Uh, but this is a company that is just experiencing phenomenal growth. Let me uh, just take a look at the Wi-Fi Interactive here, where I have a chart over the last year. And you can see we are consolidating since last August here and just broke in one day, uh, huge to the upside. And given the length of this consolidation, I have to think there's more more to come there. Um, and then you take a look at the last three years. This is a company that really came alive in the year of AI, and uh, that's the story there. Let me just uh, quote Barclays, um, just a quick quote. They rate the stock an overweight price target. They increased to 396 from 335, saying uh, Supermicro likely shipped 9,000 AI servers, that's their business, uh, building the computers that these uh, chips uh, that do all the AI work are in, in the December quarter, and that's thanks to improving GPU graphics processing unit supply and strong AI demand. They expect another full year of 2024 guidance increasing when they report, when this company reports results later in the month. So uh, hard to find anything negative here, maybe a, a little bit in the gross margin department. Yeah, I mean, so the technical suggestion maybe Ooh, more room to run. Technicals are strong. Technicals are strong. And you know, the analysts, I mean, you look at the commentary, Jared, they like this name. I mean, it's had a strong run already, but 10 buys, one hold, one sell. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. All right, we got to move on to shares of iRobot in the red, deep red today, after the Wall Street Journal reported an EU regulator is going to block Amazon's $1.4 billion bid to buy the Roomba maker. And uh, I was wondering, I, I thought early in the pandemic, this is a company that's just begging to be acquired by Amazon, and it looks like this isn't going to happen. We don't have official sources here. I do have a comment from uh, Citi, and they're saying, while it's difficult to confirm this news, until an official announcement is made, iRobot shares are likely going to trade lower. Uh, no kidding, as investors remain concerned about worsening financials. So anytime an M&A deal goes south, and we've seen this with Spirit today, yep. um, there is fallout on multiple channels. Yeah, I mean, not not totally surprising because, you know, you saw these reports that the EU Commission would, was going to be thinking about opposing this deal. Apparently, they were kind of worried that Amazon would obviously use the position to favor, I guess, iRobot products over, over rivals, right? And you can see the response. I mean, Amazon investors obviously don't see this as some major blow. Uh, for iRobot, it's a bit, a bit different. I mean, I think that, you know, kind of the broader issue here, it just hammers home this point, Jared, if you're a big mm -hmm. tech company, Getting a deal done in this climate with these regulators on both sides of the pond, increasingly ing aggressive, it, it is tough, tough sledding there. Yeah, good point there. Uh, real quick, I'm just going to chart this on the Wi-Fi Interactive. iRobot, since inception, going back to before the global financial crisis, um, had a series, had a big peak before the pandemic. And then, like a lot of companies where there, there was a lot of excitement in the pandemic, it just kind of fell off a cliff. Uh, without this first peak in here, I'd say it looks like Peloton, but with this, uh, it's just a giant M top. <laughs> and finally here, shares of Wayfair moving higher today after the company announcing uh, that it will cut more than 1,600 jobs, roughly 13% of its workforce. So that, that is the news on the online retailer. More layoffs here, Jared. Um, mm -hmm. The company, remember, has done a few rounds now, these layoffs. CEO saying in a memo to staff, we went overboard in hiring during a strong economic period and veered away from core principles. He talked about how the company has come quite 
far back then, but not quite there yet. Yeah, we saw a lot of this um, tech company cost cutting. Uh, that was kind of a that was a year ago story, but we still see the fallout from that. Um, this is their third round of job cuts. They look like they're targeting 200 million, 280 million annualized cost savings. But I want to go back to the chart here on the Wi-Fi Interactive, and this is a company. Um, I was just mentioning, we had a double, we had an M top, we had a peak there in the previous company. Well, we don't have that peak, we just have one for the pandemic, and we're now in the lower end of that range. And uh, if you take a look over the last year, you can see just a lot of choppy trading action, but this is in by no way, uh, I don't have this uh, chart available, but um, Amazon, for instance, compared to Wayfair, is just uh, knocking it out of the park. Yeah, for sure. Stock's up about 40% over the past 12 months. At least the bulls, like I'm looking at this, uh, summary from the team at Truist, they like this one. They call this, you know, from their perspective, a reasonable move. They told their clients, in their opinion, this strengthens the company's operational execution, should protect free cash flow and improve margins. They have a buy and actually raise their price target to 70 on the name. So one to watch for sure. Moving on, we're just getting started here on Yahoo Finance Live. Coming up, Apple's highly anticipated mixed reality headset, the Vision Pro, is now available for pre-order in the US, but some major apps are steering clear for now. We're gonna break down the details on the other side. Plus, the newest edition of our series, Goodbye or Goodbye. We'll get analysts insight to break down two cybersecurity stocks to help you make the best choices for your portfolio. All that and more when Yahoo Finance returns. can't talk streaming wars without talking Netflix. The company that once sent you a DVD in the mail is still the industry leader, but when fourth quarter results hit on January 23rd, there are three key issues that shareholders will be watching. First up, subscriber growth, still the granddaddy of them all. That all important metric will stand out as the true measure of success. Last time out, Netflix shocked the street by adding almost 9 million subscribers in the third quarter. That was the biggest net ad since the COVID era when we were all stuck at home binge watching Riverdale. It was also a sign the crackdown on password sharing was creating full paying subscribers. Can the trend continue? 
Then there's pricing. In the third quarter, Netflix announced increases across some key regions. The recently phased out basic plan went from $9.99 to $11.99, and the premium plan from $19.99 to $22.99. The recession didn't happen, but can the average American still afford this along with the daily pistachio latte? Of course, you can't talk about pricing without discussing the much-heralded ad-supported plan. Launched over a year ago, it now boasts 15 million monthly active users. Can momentum continue to build there? And last but not least, content. It's still king, and Netflix and its competitors are nothing without the shows and movies that keep you unsociable all year round. Spending on content creation is expected to land at around $17 billion this year. That number was skewed last year thanks to the impact of the Hollywood writer's strike. Remember that? The push for original material has been a big part of the strategy for co-CEOs Ted Sarandos and Greg Peters, but could increased licensing deals be the smarter play for the company? How much importance will be placed on local language unscripted series? We'll also be listening out for any mention of how gaming could be a much bigger part of the strategy going forward. Does all this set us up for a strong report? Wedbush analyst Alicia Reese thinks the company has the right formula now. Do you agree? Lots to discuss. We'll build up to the report and break it all down the moment it hits here on Yahoo Finance. It's pre-order day for Apple's Vision Pro headset. This comes following a rough start to 2024 for the tech giant. Joining us now is Yahoo Finance's Dan Howley. Dan, what are the details here? Yeah, Jared, right now uh, I'm actually going through the setup process to try to get one of these. When you do, you're going to have to have an iPhone or iPad with you uh, basically to take a scan of your face. Uh, it's going to tell you to look up, down, left, right, kind of similar to what you do when you set up Face ID. And that's the way that it takes measurements for you to ensure that you're getting a right fit when you have this. The, the big reason why you want a good fit is because you don't want uh, light leaking in to kind of take you away from that uh, immersive experience that Apple's offering. So far, though, uh, it looks like there are backups as far as the uh, uh, delivery date. So they're, they're appear to be slipping uh, as far away as March. Uh, it's going to take quite a while. I just set one up, uh, $3,500, uh, $3,499. I set one up with Zeiss uh, optical inserts for my glasses. Uh, $4,147 is what I would pay. Uh, I don't think I got paid this week, so it's not happening. <laughs> um, but I, I, I do think that it's something uh, worth watching to see how many people actually buy and how long those uh, uh, delivery times end up getting delayed just because it shows how much people are interested in this product. And it's still a nascent market, uh, but you know we've seen Meta in here for quite a while and it hasn't taken off uh, as much as maybe Mark Zuckerberg would have hoped. So we'll have to see if Apple can, can kind of stoke these fires. And Dan, what do you think the most popular use cases for this device are going to be? Not not just in the near term, but kind of you know farther out. Do you think this is going to be? Listen, this is really going to be for gamers. Is it going to be for people watching movies or sports? Are going to pe are people going to use it at work? I mean, hands down, the the real the reason why people have these headsets right now is gaming, right? And so, uh, if you're not a gamer or you're not even you know interested in gaming at all, then it, it's not really a, a, a system for you. Uh, that's how it is with the, the Meta Quest. There are some work uh, options where you can you know, dip into meetings and things like that, but let's face it, you don't want to turn on your camera on your laptop for a meeting. You're not going to want to strap on a headset for a meeting. I, if you don't want to see something, someone in the flesh, you don't want to see a virtual version of them either. Uh, the, the thing that I think Apple is banking on is that you would use this as a pro productivity device to extend your screen. So you would look down at your Mac and then, oh, here's a giant version of that screen up here. That's very cool. I, I got to uh, look at uh, a version of that. Uh, the other is watching uh, interactive videos or 3D videos, things like that. When I tried it uh, in June at uh, WWDC, I got to see a version, uh, a 3D version of the the Avatar movie, which looked very cool. Uh, you know, I, I got to say that the overall between any of the the devices that I've used. The, the Vision Pro is is the best. The fidelity for the screen is amazing. You put it on and you see the pass through and you know it, it looks great. Uh, I think the, the real question is, do people want something like this? And if so, why? I said it before, I have a 65 inch OLED TV. I have my PlayStation there. I can get up and walk to the fridge. I can lay down. I don't have to worry about a headset. I'll have to see when I get my hands on the, the, the Vision Pro if that makes me change my mind. Yeah, if you're not sold, uh, I'm really interested to see these preview numbers as they come out. But thank you for that report here, Dan Howley.
And Netflix expected to post a strong finish to the year when it reports earnings next week. Two analysts raising their price targets on the stock ahead of results. In the past year, the streamer has weathered the storm of Hollywood, raising or Hollywood strikes, raising prices, and adding an ad tier plan. Joining us now is Michael Pachter, Wedbush Managing Director of Equity Research. Uh, thank you for joining us here today on a Friday afternoon. Just tell us uh, broadly, what do you expect for this report next week? You might, you might be muted, sir. Are you guys muted me? Sorry, I apologize. Uh, I think they're gonna have solid subscriber additions. And in particular, I think you're gonna see them grow in the US and Canada. And, and, and we say that because we conducted a survey and saw some real traction on both the ad supported product and on the password sharing crackdown. Um, we had 15% of subscribers who were notified that they were sharing passwords say that they'd actually opted to add um, another account. So that, that raises ARPU, that's considered the same account. But uh, that number that you reported in your, in your CAN piece just before this um, said 15 million ad supported subs, that number rose to 23 million during the quarter. So, you know, where did those 8 million people come from? That should be directly from a reduction of the people who otherwise would have churned out. So I think you're going to be pleasantly surprised, your investors will be pleasantly sur surprised when they report their numbers. They should beat that 8.75 million uh, target, and I think they'll probably beat it by a million or two. And, and Michael, listen, it is great to see you, my friend, and always love having you on the show. I, I wanted to get your take on another angle for this company, Michael, because listen, no, nobody knows the video game sector better better than you. Their gaming strategy, Michael, right now they do offer games, you know, they're free, it's sort of a way to keep the users engaged. What what do you think, Michael, their long-term strategy is when it comes to gaming and, and how do they how do they make money off it? You know, you showed the two guys who are making the decisions, you know, Ted Sarandos and Greg Peters. Uh, my guess is neither of them has ever played a game in their lives, and, and it shows. Um, they clearly have no idea what they're doing. Uh, so their strategy is to offer things on Netflix that you can't get elsewhere. And the problem is that consumers you know, can get games pretty much anywhere, and they don't really think of Netflix as the place to go. Um, so they're trying to do the same strategy with games that they have with TV and film, you know, exclusive content. It's just not going to work. I mean, the smarter thing to do would be to put all sorts of games on your landing screen on Netflix. So let us play Candy Crush but launch it from our Netflix app as opposed to you know, having to go to our PC or go into a separate app. And if they get consumers used to playing, that'll work. So long-term strategy is gonna have to change. This one is doomed. There's no chance they ever make money from this. Um, they did recently back off of that exclusive thing by adding the Grand Theft Auto Mobile Trilogy. I know you guys are dying to buy that. It's $11.99 on your iPhone and it is free on Netflix. So go for it. Um, there, there have been over 20 million downloads. So consumers will respond to something that they'd have to pay for elsewhere and get it free on Netflix, but that costs money. I'm sure that, that Netflix had to spend 20 or 40 million bucks to get that exclusive. Um, I think they have to do a lot more of that. And instead of paid downloads, they should just offer free to play games like Fortnite that otherwise you know, we wouldn't be playing um, on our phones because Fortnite's banned from the app store, for example. Interesting point there. But Michael, just kind of thinking about the Apple Vision Pro, I want to take it back. Uh, we were just talking to Dan Howley about the launch and the taking pre-orders today. Netflix has largely slub, uh, snubbed it. Um, this is what it seems to me that Netflix and watching movies would be a tremendous use case. Uh, just wondering what your thoughts on that interaction is between these two companies. Yeah, you know, you guys pay Dan too much because he and I have the same living room set up. I have an <laughs> LG 65-inch OLED and a PlayStation. Uh, look, it, it, the 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 bet Netflix is making is that there are only going to be, a, you know, 100,000 or 200,000 under a million Vision Pro sold. So why embrace it? Let's let's take a wait and see attitude. It costs money to adapt content to Vision Pro. Um, I'm pretty confident that, you know, that uh, Apple is paying Disney to support it. They're not going to pay Netflix. So I think Netflix will see. And if they're, you know, if they sell 50 million Vision Pros, yes, Netflix will be there. If it's, you know, this this ver this year's version of 3D television where nobody really bought one, uh, who cares? I kind of think Vision Pro will work when the price point drops below 500 bucks. Keep in mind 
that only about 250 million televisions are sold every year at an average price of $350. And Netflix is, is charging 10x that. So best case, maybe they sell 25 million. I don't even think that they'll come close to that. And Mike, I want to get you out of here on this. Beyond just the, the Netflix earnings print, I'm just interested to get your take on kind of, as you look at the streaming landscape in 2024, kind of the big just trends and themes, you know, you're watching, Michael. Is it, are you looking for more sports, more bundles, more uh, ads? What are, you, what, are you, what are you searching for? Yeah, the big, the big trend, those, those same two CEOs that you highlighted from Netflix are actually smart guys. They're just terrible at games. Um, they finally figured out they need to be profitable, so they're cutting back on content spend. And while they're doing that, their competitors are flipping exactly the other direction. So you have, you know, an NFL game on Peacock, an NFL playoff game at whatever the hell they said, $110 million for one game. Dumbest thing ever. All it does is piss people off. Um, so, no, I think that the cable companies that have competing streaming products are not Amazon and not Apple, but the other guys have to protect retransmission fees. And the way to protect retransmission fees is keep live content on cable TV and force consumers to subscribe to cable. When you start shifting that to streaming, you're cutting your own throat. You're you're ensuring the end of your business. And you know when Disney tries to separate out ESPN, they're going to see the retransmission fees for ESPN get cut in half. They're screwed. So I think it's really dumb. Um, and I think some of the content guys are smart. Some of them are not. Um, Iger's not smart about this. He's smarter than me and everything else. Not about this. Zaslav might be smart enough. He's doing some really smart things on HBO content, you know, essentially putting it into syndication after three or four years. That's smart. But man, spending money on live sports content, dumb, dumb, dumb. All right. Appreciate your opinions here and lots of insights that so we're looking forward to uh, those Netflix earnings next week. Thank you for that, Michael Pachter. Thank you, guys. And coming up, the latest edition of our series, Goodbye or Goodbye. We're going to be joined by an analyst to put two cybersecurity stocks head to head and help you make your best choices for your portfolio. Stick around. More Yahoo Finance after this.
It's a big, noisy universe of stocks out there. Welcome to Goodbye or Goodbye. Our goal, to help cut through that noise to navigate the best moves for your portfolio. Macquarie predicts 2024 will be a highly hostile year for digital threats, which could be a tailwind for names in the cybersecurity sector. But which names are best positioned and what's the best way to play it now? I'm here with Fred Havemeyer, Macquarie's head of US AI and software research. Fred, it is good to see you. Thank you for joining us. So I want to start, Fred, today. We're going to um, start with yeah, your first pick here, which I think a lot of investors are going to know is CrowdStrike. And let's walk through some of the reasons here, Fred. Uh, CrowdStrike, you say, is a buy. The price target, 285. Your first reason here, Fred, is that you note that CrowdStrike is best breed endpoint security platform. Kind of walk us through that. Absolutely. Thank you very much for having me on. Um, CrowdStrike, I think many likely have been familiar with this name. It is the best of breed endpoint security product out there. So when you need something to protect you on your laptops, on your workstations, on your devices, we think that CrowdStrike is the software that you're going to go to. This is a company that excels at detecting and preventing both known and unknown threats. And in this year where we see just the threat landscape as we referred to and as you mentioned, becoming just exceptionally hostile, uh, mm. we think that you need that kind of best of breed protection that can manage everything, whether or not the threat has been seen before. Okay, let's go to point number two, Fred. Yeah. Let's see the, the second reason you believe. You kind of mentioned this, but basically yeah. you're looking at across 2024, you see you see an increasingly hostile oh, environment, yes. and this is one way to, these are the guys who are going to step in to help CIOs protect the companies. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And we see them actually leading this charge here throughout. And I think that when we look at this year in particular, like uh, 2024, 2023 was already a hostile landscape, but going into 2024, with this presidential election cycle, with the multiple different hot wars at this point as well, too, in addition to the rise of generative AI, making phishing attacks more sophisticated, just we see the culmination of a number of things, including cartel-like activity among mm -hmm. attackers, uh, uh, threat actors, that we think the landscape is set up such that you are, I think, having a very constructive cybersecurity demand environment, and we think it's a, a really solid tailwind for CrowdStrike. All right, ra last bullet here, Fred. Yeah. Let's see this last one. One is Gen AI, Gen AI powered attacks. Yes. So that one is something we're watching very closely. We think that with the rise of generative AI, there's abundant ways that this is going to benefit businesses, but also we think it lowers the bar for how sophisticated attackers need to be to pull off complex attacks. We think it also makes personalized phishing a much more uh, pronounced risk. So we think CrowdStrike, once again, is well positioned to help mitigate against those attacks. And wow. it, is, it is pure play, like machine learning in the back end. It is a machine learning company. And Fred, you know, so you're making a compelling case here. Viewers who are listening in right now, right? Before they pile in and commit capital to this name, yes. Fred, what are just some risks they need to know about? Absolutely. It's always good to have a very healthy perspective on a company. And when we look at CrowdStrike, we tend to think that this is a company that, while we love it, still does have risk from either the company saturating the end, in the enterprise marketplace, just hitting that uh, threshold where it has substantial market share and it can't, it would need to move down market, which could be more competitive and where you might see companies like Microsoft mm. uh, really going out there with products that in that case could be good enough, may not be nearly as good as CrowdStrike, but could be competitive. And we think that competition is where things get a little risky, potentially. All right, so that's your buy, Fred. Let's yes. also look at one you're not as enthusiastic about. That is Okta here. Now, we don't want to overstate it, Fred, right? Because yes. you're not going to sell. You're neutral. No, so you, no. you're basically a hold. It. Your price target is 80. But let's walk through some of these names, too, of why, Fred, you, you don't, you wouldn't be rushing to buy this one. First bullet point yeah. here, still rebuilding trust. Talk us about that. Well, Ox has had a number of significant and high-profile data breaches and data issues over the past several years now. And the company, as of this past quarter, uh, said that what they're doing is they're focusing their time and effort and commitments and R&D commitments towards uh, bolstering their security practices to prevent any future breaches or any sort of security incidents in the future. So really, this company is focusing on what it needs to do, which is rebuilding trust with customers. It takes time, though, and it mm -hmm. brings risk. Got it. Second bullet point, second reason you're at a neutral here, delayed product releases. Yep. So with this, as the company announced last quarter, they put all product releases except for privilege access management on hiatus while they focus their R&D efforts on just security. So they're delaying shipping most products and focusing on security. That brings risks mm -hmm. as well. Like they're doing what they need to do and the right things on trying to rebuild that trust. But in doing so, they could be deferring future growth with delaying shot, uh, product shipments. All right, third and final reason here, Fred, yeah. you would be on the sidelines when it comes to Okta. Questioning yeah. guidance. Oh, yeah. I think we, at our core, are questioning whether or not guidance was sufficiently de-risked for the trust that needs to be rebuilt, whether or not the company actually 
uh, do risk guidance sufficiently in a case that churn appears going mm -hmm. into the back half of this year. And final point here, so what would it take, Fred, for you to get more bullish on the name? Right. I think that if Okta did de-risk guidance sufficiently, and if we see that churn is stable, rather that the company doesn't see significant churn while it rebuilds trust, then this is a reasonably valued company. So we're going to give it some time. We would avoid it for now. But if we see signs that it addressed its security commitments uh, uh, issues and it is rebuilding that trust, there could be upside here. All right, potential upside there. So let's sum this up for you. So you're telling investors buy CrowdStrike based on its profitable growth and AI tools. And on the other side, you're saying avoid Okta. You're on the sidelines there as the company's still rebuilding trust and holding back product releases. Thanks. Thank you, Fred, so much for joining us today. Thank we, you very much. We appreciate it. Thank you for watching. Goodbye, or goodbye. We're bringing you new episodes three times a week at 3.30 p.m. Eastern right here. Artificial intelligence was all the rage at the World Economic Forum in Davos this week. And coming off the hype of 2023, what can we now expect from AI in the new year? We're here with Fred Havemeyer, Macquarie's head of U.S. AI and software research with what to expect in 2024. Fred, it is great to see you again. Um, maybe we'll start there, Fred. So obviously there was this just boom of interest in AI from investors last year. As we now roll into 2024 here, how do you expect this technology to evolve? Absolutely. I think... Uh, going into this year, 2024, from our perspective, is going to be the year where we see enterprises really turning on their demand and their spending on generative AI. I think what we saw is that in 2023, and even going into 2024, many businesses are extremely interested in generative AI. Many of them, many boards are asking their C-suites, what is our generative AI strategy? And I think in 2024, we're going to shift from a place where enterprises have been in pilot phases, testing the technology, 
dipping their toes into the water and really beginning now to actually spend and invest and deploy this technology for like line of business users. Mm. So exciting times. Yeah, there's been a little bit of a disappointment, I think, in, in the community about co-pilot adoption. What is it actually capable of? Is this a year that it kind of breaks out? And maybe you can just talk about the sales strategy of Microsoft overall. Absolutely. I think that this year is when we're going to begin to see enterprises really adopting it from our perspective. But at the same time, I do want to just caution a little bit that we're not expecting it to necessarily just turn on overnight. When we look at it, we are beginning to, rather, we're, we're basing our estimates on Microsoft really beginning to materially monetize this going into its fiscal year 2026, which would be the calendar year ended in June 2026, where we estimate that Microsoft can generate about $9 billion of incremental revenue from co-pilots which amounts in our estimates to about 49 cents of incremental EPS based on our analysis of generative AI uh, products and services, gross margins and so forth. But what we think is clear here is that there's going to be a ramp up. We think the revenue can turn on relatively quickly, but we think it will take some time for enterprises to test and develop that certainty that they have some ROI out of these products. And more near term on, yeah. on that name, uh, Fred, you know, so Microsoft reporting January 30th, yes. What a run, I mean, it's up about 70% of the last 12 months. Near term, what do you expect to hear when they report earnings? I think when we're considering Microsoft, what we're always looking to hear more about is the company's generative AI strategy, how they're beginning to sell those products, how they're really focusing on driving that enterprise adoption, and what indications they can offer us to say that this is not a flash in the pan trend, but really this is a long-term durable trend, which we believe that will begin to appear. I think when we looked at it last quarter, we found the company uh, we estimate the company was actually showing uh, generative AI products and services in the Azure segment uh, running at over a billion dollar revenue run rate. So we think mm -hmm. that this is already material and we're looking to see more materiality. We got time for one more here. Yes. I'll give you the floor. Anything interesting you might be expecting uh, from AI this year? I think this year there's a tremendous amount of interesting things. We can talk about it from the perspective of cyber warfare, we can talk about it from the perspective of business transformation, but what we think is we're within this context of enterprise purchasing, we think we'll begin to see more tailwinds emerge for businesses like a Microsoft and a ServiceNow. And I think when we look at a company like ServiceNow, uh, there's a lot of opportunity from our perspective to really change how service, uh, customer service and service desk tasks are run. And we think that they are another key candidate for generative AI providing tailwinds. All right, we're going to leave it there. Really, really appreciate your, inf uh, your inputs here and uh, stopping by for a couple of segments. Thank you, Fred. Thank you very much for having me. All right, Ford's top selling electric pickup in the U.S. is looking at a production or at a reduction in production. Here with the details is Yahoo Finance's Proz Supermanian and a reduction in the production. Uh, give us the details. Yeah, Jared, you know, some may be asking, does that mean demand is waning here? You know, Ford, like you mentioned, reducing its F-150 Lightning production, that EV truck to one shift. Uh, at the factory in Rouge and, and uh, the Rouge factory in Detroit. Uh, now, Ford isn't saying how much production will be reduced by, but in December, they were telling suppliers that they saw production coming down from coming down from 3,200 vehicles to 1,600 vehicles a week. Uh, now, Ford said to me that demand wasn't an issue. A, a spokesman said that, quote, we continue to see growth just at a slower pace. We're adjusting to that growth. Now, I spoke to Ford CEO Jim Farley about Ford's EV outlook just this past week, and he claimed that price was the key. It's not about, it's, it's, it's more now about converting mainstream customers and that they need to compete on a price in order to convert them. So for EVs and the Lightning, at least for now, Ford resetting here, I guess right-sizing, as some would say, the supply part of the equation. Praz, thank you as always for joining us for the show and giving us that insight. We appreciate it. Have a great weekend. You too, man. All right, let's get a check on some trending tickers in today's trade. We're going to start off with Spirit Airlines shares soaring today in today's session. That's after raising fourth quarter guidance, now expecting revenue of $1.3 billion. So lots of headlines actually on this one, Jerry. Yes. Spirit Airlines, I mean, obviously, listen, got crushed after the judge blocked the merger with JetBlue, said the tie-up would hurt consumers. Now the company, though, says, okay, frankly, we still think a combination is the best opportunity. Reuters, by the way, is reporting that Spirit is indeed pressing JetBlue to appeal that decision to block the merger. So we'll see how that plays out. 
And then separately, the company also gave us some new financials to think about. Q4 revenue will reach the high end of its range and investors like that. Sure, and um, avoiding the elephant in the room here, we got some famous traders, some famous day traders <laughs> on right. X, the uh, platform formerly known as Twitter. Um, Dave Portnoy, you know, yesterday he managed to buy, he kind of, I don't want to call it top tick, but as soon as he said he had buy, bought Spirit uh, with some Bang, news drive, boom. Hits. Yeah, that, <laughs> right. that, hit, that headline that dominated yesterday hits and he's out like 25%, but the stock had been done, had been down considerably before that. Um, just in terms of all the drama here, I like uh, biz, I like Bloomberg uh, Intelligence's recapitulation of it. They say a U.S. judge's rejection of JetBlue Spirit's merger leaves Spirit with few, few options, and here's why. Low liquidity, muted operating margin, and cash gener generation. They are dwarfed by these purchase obligations for the future, their debt, $1.5 billion, due or needing refinancing in 2024. So without cash sources, you know, they're going to have to scramble here. We've seen this before where we have an anticipated merger, and I think this is number two that we're talking about today, and then we have some knock-on effects when that just, uh, that program, that number one options gets kind of thrown out the window. Yeah, Portnoy, by the way, on X, Really, a lot today. I mean, he yeah. is swinging very hard on this day and trying to. Well, he's winning. Yeah, you know, I'd, yeah. I'd be talking my book too if I were finally winning on this trade that kind of beat me up yesterday. So, good luck to uh, Dave there. Uh, Nvidia has been knocked off the top spot for Citigroup's top specialty chip stock as it hands the crown to Marvel Technology. The stock jumping on the news with analyst Atif Malik citing strong AI optics growth and revenue potential. Um, so, here's another stock we're talking about. Uh, you know, you got to wonder where in the, uh, I'm sorry, I was trying to uh, get a chart that's not coming up here, but there have been another, a number of upgrades recently, and uh, it's not just by Raymond James. We have also Cowan, they raise their price target to 75. From 75, William O'Neill reinstated a uh, price target at Susquehanna up to 80 from 65, and also at City up to City up to 75 from 61. Yes, City just, listen, they believe, bottom line, this is just a smart play on the AI boom, right? We were just talking to uh, Fred from Macquarie about that. The stock can move higher, they think, on growth in the AI optics market, among other reasons. They say Marvell could see a trough, it sounds like, for markets like enterprise networking and carrier. So he's got to buy on Marvell. But he does like NVIDIA, too. We want to be clear about that. He, but no, it's said, listen, it, enjoy this 20% plus run into CES. Honestly, both names have enjoyed these amazing ones. I mean, we, we know the move NVIDIA has made but Marvell is also up about 80% in the past year. Yep, I agree. I, w <laughs> I, I, I was trying to, I was fishing for my heat map and uh, my semiconductor heat map eludes me, but basically confirming what you just said. And, and by the way, City's not alone. I mean, the street loves this Yeah, one. I was just reading off this long list. I was a little bit surprised. There's more than 85% say this one's a buy, zero sells. Consensus trade right there. All right, finally, shares of Celsius sliding as B of A securities downgrades that one to neutral Lowers the price target to $65. So the team at Bank of America, Jared, no longer fans. They go from buy to neutral. Why the lack of love? Well, they think pressure from competition, that's going to be a problem in their opinion. So names like Monster and Red Bull could weigh on growth this year. They talk about a lack of differentiation, innovation, heightened competition. That's going to be a problem, they think, for Celsius to meaningfully kind of expand share here. Yeah, the competition. I mean, Monster has been a monster, not only in terms of its name, but its stock performance uh, over the last 25 years. Uh, but here is here's a note from an analyst, um, from the analyst we're talking about. Uncertainty around sales growth now weighs on what had been a more favorable risk-reward profile, profile than when they were benefiting from the momentum of the Pepsi distribution deal. And then here's another quote. We flag a lack of differentiating innovation and heightened competition as potential hurdles to Celsius' ability to meaningfully expand market share, um, lowering the fourth quarter sales estimate to 340 million, 341 million from 351 million. By the way, a minute left to the bell here. And uh, the adjusted EBIT, EBITDA target, 55 million from 56 and a half, also maintaining a $65 price target on the shares. Yeah, so he cuts his rating to, he's, he moves to the sidelines, but he does maintain his target. Nice run for the stock, by the way. It is up about 60% in the past 12 months. Uh, but listen, that obviously is enough for B of A. They move to the sidelines. All right, we got the closing bell on Wall Street, and let's get a quick check of the markets here. Uh, we're only 25 seconds left, and uh, looks like the Dow up about one percentage point exactly. NASDAQ composite up 1.64%, S&P 500 
up over 1% to 4,837.64. And guess what, guys? That's going to be a record. It's been three years or two years in the making. S&P 500 finally hits a closing record high today. It, it is amazing, Jerry, because we, I mean, obviously 2023 ends, we rip in Q4, right? And we end in, what, 24% for the SPX. Then we got it chopped around to start the year. Yes. Kind of a pause, took a bit of a preview. You saw some people make, maybe some booking, some profits off what had been some incredible gains. Now, though, perhaps, you know, getting back in and buying those tech names. Yeah, and, you know, it's interesting to think two years ago, uh, S&P 500 top tick for the entire year. So I think it was the very first trading day of the year. That was the record high. And then it was down from there. And then just thinking about how we're coming into this year after a, a really surprisingly bullish year, we've had some bearish inklings uh, in the month of January. Santa Claus rally was negative. Uh, first five days of January was negative. If the month of, Feb of January itself ends negative, that portends red for the entire year with a decent, a decent statistical probability. Uh, but you know, maybe the S&P 500 is going to turn things around for everybody. Yeah, it is interesting because how many bulls that we, that we talked to who said, you know, when they looked at 2024, why were they positive? Why were they constructive? It was because, well, the Fed, I mean, I don't know how many strategists we heard this from. The story kind of went, the Fed's going to cut early, they're going to cut often, and the rally's going to broaden. And now, though, actually, you see, as, as you were talking about earlier in the show, Jared, people may be getting a little skeptical of how early they're going to cut and how often. And yeah. in fact, they love tech. Yes. Well, it's not mutually exclusive either. Uh, but I personally don't see the Fed cutting until uh, we see a recession on the horizon. And that's not even that's not the, anything I expect to see this particular year. Yeah. For All sure. right, we got to talk of Meta. So uh, Meta is another stock. I believe it hit a record closing high. Uh, I don't have the data in front of me, unfortunately, but uh, Meta has just been on a tear. And the year of cost cutting that Mark Zuckerberg instituted last year, where I think he reduced headcount. Year head, of efficiency. Yeah, 25%. Yeah. Guess what, guys? That had a huge effect on the stock. And I, I wasn't going to count it out because I've seen these huge dips by Meta when it was Facebook before, you know, down 20 30%. It bounced back and actually bounced back quite a bit uh, quicker than I thought it would this time. This stock is an absolute monster. It's up about 180% over the past year. That doesn't mean any lack of love on the street. The street loves this name. Almost you know, 90% of analysts who are paid to tell you what to do with the stock say you should buy it. And of course, you know, it's the year of efficiency, as, as you mentioned, Jared. It's also people have decided a smart AI play. Yeah, I, I would agree there too. All right, time now for what to watch. Next week, while well, on the earnings front, airlines in focus with United, Alaska Air, and Southwest all set to report. Investors will closely watch Netflix earnings after the bell Tuesday for any insight into how its ad tier is faring. And then there's Tesla earnings set for Wednesday. Will come days after Elon Musk threatened to move his AI efforts elsewhere unless he gains more control of the company. Yeah, and it's also a big week for econ data. Flash PMI, that's out Thursday. It's going to give investors a fresh insight into the growth and inflation trends in the new year. Plus, we're going to get preliminary Q4 GDP data for a look at how much the economy grew in the final quarter of 2023. And the Fed's favorite inflation gauge is out Friday. Investors closely watching PCE data as personal consumption expenditures for signs of a continual cooling to bolster the case for a March rate cut that investors don't think is coming. And tune in for Yahoo Finance's latest theme week. The AI revolution after the hype of 2023. What is next for artificial intelligence? We are talking uh, about the biggest players, top ways to play the trend. And of course, we will see a regulation crackdown in 2024, bringing you coverage all week long on Yahoo Finance. Well, that will do it for today's Yahoo Finance Live. Be sure to come back Monday at 3 p.m. Eastern for all of your coverage leading up to and after the closing bell. Some of the biggest names in global business descended at the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. Yahoo Finance, of course, here on the ground, and we had the opportunity to speak with many prominent figures specifically about geopolitical risks and AI. Here's a roundup of what some of them had to say. So much AI talk here at the World Economic Forum, so little time to talk about it all. So let's get uh, more on all things AI with ServiceNow CEO 
Bill McDermott. Bill, good to talk to you in person for a change. Great. I usually come remote from somewhere. <laughs> Great to be with you, Brian and Julie. Thank you. So what, is, what has surprised you about all this AI discussion here at the conference? Business transformation. These CEOs that are here know that they're investing heavily in technology because generative AI in particular can give them an outcome. So it's not technology for technology's sake. This year, $5 trillion will be spent on technology, most of it on software and services. And Gen AI is the moment in which the CEOs are no longer thinking about investing. They know they have to invest because if they don't and their competitor does, they may not be around too long. And this has been well documented. There were 1,200 CEOs surveyed. The question was, will you invest in Gen AI? to which 1,200 applied and said yes. 71% of them said we would raise capital from other areas or, or um, simply um, get a loan before we would not invest in Gen AI. So there's a very serious commitment to it because it can deliver an outcome. I, I gotta say, Bill, I'm a little confused. But, you know, because we have some people we've talked to who have said, um, it's still early days in AI. We want to move carefully and deliberately. We have other people like you're supposed to say it's you have to, for competitive reasons you have to invest in it. Um, you have people who say you know that it's not really being deployed that mm -hmm. much yet. There's others who say I'm using it in my business mm -hmm. already. Yeah. Uh, so I, I don't know. I'm a little turned around. <laughs> yeah, and it's understandable that you are, Julie. That's because a lot of people are talking about marketing, brochures, the future. We're talking about ServiceNow's platform now. We have domain-specific LLMs, which means that we build the LLM to the customer's industry. We build the use case based on, is it an IT use case, an employee experience, customer or creator use case? And now you have that on one platform with one architecture and one data model. So we already have the products. We released Vancouver, which was our big AI release in September on the 29th. On the 30th, we had one day to take orders and we had four mega orders. And the momentum for our Gen AI has continued. Why? Because it works and it's gonna make people more productive, 35 to 40% more productive in all the use cases that we have. We have 15 of them within ServiceNow right now, delivering 35, 40, and 50 in some cases. So this is, productivity on steroids, but it's also making people happy. We give them a virtual agent, which answers questions for them in natural language. We set it up in 15 minutes. So this is a completely different architecture, entirely new idea, and I'm unaware of another platform in the world that does what ServiceNow does. So that's why I'm so optimistic and so certain because we're taking orders. Yeah. What are your biggest concerns around AI? Well, my biggest concern around AI is that we don't move quickly enough to put more and more innovation into the platform. And I don't have to worry too much because I have the best engineering team in the business. For us, because we're in command and control of our own destiny, I'm not worried. But I am worried if people don't go for this move now and don't get in front of this, I truly believe that businesses will suffer. You know, a lot of people talk about jobs. You know, Time Magazine put out an article in 1966 that AI would cost people jobs. In fact, computers would take 90% of the jobs and the states would have to subsidize their livelihood to keep them sustainable. Uh, 90 million jobs later, technology is still the baseline for value creation, job creation, and momentum. So technology is the forefront of everything. You gotta move on it, you gotta move on it now. And it's for people's benefit. You know, we'll retool, reskill six out of 10 people. And that's going to happen. Guess what? CEOs need to be retooled and reskilled. This is the era of the agile CEO. I have a company that can close its books two days before the end of the quarter. That's because we're running the company on the ServiceNow platform. We're completely agile. Everything is transparent in real time. And we know exactly where we stand minute to minute. That's the future. That's what it has to be. Bill, on the flip side, you know, if you look at the potential regulation of AI, um, earlier Brian talked to Mark Benioff and made the parallel with social media, which was not really regulated at all at the time and now trying to catch up. And he, 
I won't repeat what he said Choice here. words. Choice words for, for, for how it has been. But, you know, if you look at AI in parallel, don't we need to get out ahead of it and, and figure out some guardrails around it so you don't have these unforeseen consequences? I want to just differentiate the two environments. I'm talking about the business environment where the customers using their own data on our platform and that data is highly curated meaning they've been working on making sure that data is correct for many years now. So that's one scenario. We also have chat GPT as an option 4.0 and we're in partnership with Microsoft and others where we can go to the open internet and bring information in at the customer's uh, request. That world does need guardrails mm. and there does need to be rules and regulations so bad things don't happen. A new survey out of PwC looking how, at how AI will impact businesses. That, of course, survey is coming at the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. Joining us now is Tim Ryan, PwC Chair and Senior Partner. Tim, good to see you. Thanks for joining us. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me back. A lot of cool stats in, in this uh, survey. One that stood out to me, 68% of U.S. CEOs see AI boosting productivity. What does that mean for jobs? What it means is uh, companies have embraced the power of Gen AI. Last year, 2023, it was all about investing and beginning to learn. 2024 will be another year. The next couple of years, there's a huge opportunity for companies to upskill their employees, to help them learn how to use this tool to do their jobs more efficiently, free up time in other areas around growth. The other thing around jobs is that we see tremendous growth opportunities for job growth in the sense that the human loop of testing AI. So we're learning on AI right now, and over the next couple of years, humans will be used to test what comes out of the AI processes. Um, how do you reassure people about jobs, though? Because yeah. the message has been yeah. pretty consistent that you know it'll make some jobs easier, yeah. it'll make jobs more productive, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. But it doesn't feel like people quite believe that. Yeah, and it's understandable. There's trust is a big gap in many things. What's really important for employers is to make sure you're transparent with your employees and make sure you bring them along on the journey. The more kind of heart and mind you have in employees who are in their jobs, the better they're going to be at their jobs. So it's important to have an open discussion with employees. And one of the biggest things is to give them the skills that they need at PwC. We've begun an upskilling journey five years ago of making employee upskilling around technology akin to an employee benefit like 401k healthcare. What we see leading companies doing is teaching their people how to use this important tool so they can gain knowledge. If you bring them along, that increases their ability to do the jobs today well, and it gives them more options going forward. So that's one important thing to do. The other important thing to do is give them the opportunity to innovate. As time frees up, they're closest to the customer, they're closest to the business process, and get, that gives them the opportunity to innovate. You know, this is what we're talking about with so-called white collar jobs, yeah. so higher skilled jobs lower skilled jobs, some of them might go away. And I wonder if they will have the same upskilling opportunities to then move up the chain. Yeah, there's, time will tell where we go at this point. We've been talking about the loss of jobs to technology for a long time sure. right now, and we continue to see opportunity for job growth out there. And, it, and what people were worried about even 20 years ago with the computer and the internet, now when we see automations five years ago, the reality is there's plenty of job growth, and that's part of it because we see tremendous innovation, new business formation, and the opportunity for people to make a difference. I do think it does come back to reskilling, and it comes back to teaching people skills at every level in the organization, but I continue to be very optimistic around job growth. Uh, ahead of the Davos, I had the chance to catch up with the, the head of the IMF, uh, and they had a survey out looking at uh, how AI will impact jobs, but what she told me was that we might need new social safety nets, yeah. most notably because baby boomers may not be able to be upskilled. Yeah. Do you think we're, we're going to see that? I think there's an opportunity for all of us to play a part to make sure we bring everybody along. The theme of Davos this year is rebuilding trust. Part of that trust is with, with people in society who have been left behind. We have a massive opportunity to do that. I think if we don't invest in skilling, if we don't give people the ability to move across companies and different jobs, we will have, the, we will have a problem around lack of a social, sa social safety net. So I think what is important is, give, is create those opportunities for people to do it. Again, I think if we do our part business, if we work with government the, at the state level, the city level, the country level, I think we have the opportunity to prevent what people are worried about. 
the other piece of Gen AI is monetization, which is a big theme, right? There haven't been that many companies that have really jumped into that. Yet 44% of the people in your survey said it will provide a net increase in profits in the next 12 months. I was really struck by that. I thought that was a high number. Yeah. It is, keep in mind, people have been on the AI journey for many years. Gen AI for many of us hit really last year with OpenAI and a number of announcements that they had made. Companies have been on this journey and they made a lot of investments for 23. I think in 24 and 25 is when we begin to see things that affect the bottom line. I think most of that is on the efficiency side. The real opportunities are ones that we can only begin to reimagine now around revenue growth opportunities. I think those come more in 25 and 26 as we, we see the real power. And again, that's where I see tremendous business and opportunity growth from that perspective as well. We're asking all leaders, Tim, uh, some of their biggest surprises so far uh, at Davos. What has been some of your biggest surprises? One of my biggest surprises is, is the massive focus focus on Gen AI. It's the only, this is my seventh year at Davos, it's the first time two years in a row the topic has stuck. So last year was Gen AI, this year was Gen AI. It tells me that it is real, it is very important, the fact that it's stuck that long. I also think one of the things is we do need to talk more. One of my surprises is a topic we're not talking enough about. And, and that is the importance of management staying focused on their businesses with all of these other things happening that are out there. We've got elections across the world, we've got geopolitical tensions, there's a lot of things on people's minds. At the end of the day, what we see in our client base is companies that are focused on their business, driving revenue growth, driving efficiencies, taking care of their employees, motivating their, motivating their employees, and going after their customers and growth. Those are the ones that are winning. And I think now more than ever, we have to talk about the need for focus because good quality management wins. Sometimes at the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland, you come across a Yahoo Finance fa fan favorite, one of those tickers on our platform that everybody just seems to love. Joining us now is C3 AI CEO, Tom Siebel. You have one of the most popular tickers on our platform. Good to see the man leading the company in person. Thank you, Brian. So, what are you working on next? Uh, tell us a little bit about enterprise software and what's the next big thing in your space? We've been building enterprise AI applications now for 15 years and we spent almost uh, two or three billion dollars building these applications for manufacturing, supply chain, demand chain, precision health, finance, defense, intelligence. And for the last two years, we've been really buckling down on generative AI. Generative AI changes everything. 
And uh, so now we're applying generative AI to manufacturing, generative AI to defense, predictive maintenance for the United States Air Force, contested logistics for Transcom, uh, uh, supply chain optimization for Coke, production optimization at Nucor Steel. Generative AI changes everything. It fundamentally changes the nature of the human computer interface uh, as it relates to enterprise application software, and this is big. Now, you are, I think we can say, a corporate technology pioneer, right? Siebel Systems was a, the company that you had that you ended up selling to Oracle, and so you um, were there at sort of the beginning edge of customer relationship management software. Compare that with what we're seeing with gener generative AI, because you said it's going to change everything. So what are the parallels, what are the big differences? Actually, I was at the beginning of enterprise application okay. software, because I was there when we started Oracle, database, then ERP, then CRM, then So you've Siebel. seen a lot of so these I've different... I've seen this for a yeah. while, and when I began, the information technology business globally was about $200 billion. Okay, now it's like, you know, seven to eight trillion. Generative AI alone, you know, is, is predicted to be like a 1.3 trillion dollar market in a few years. This is uh, the fastest growing segment of the enterprise application software market in the history of enterprise application software. Go down, walk down the promenade, Tom, and there's all these companies with demos and buzzy installations and trying to pitch people things, but not everybody can win in this. Uh, and I'm sure you know about that just having the arc of your career. Is there a shakeout in AI? And it consolidates around three or four companies. Well, a lot of it is just noise. I mean, we have these enterprise application software companies that you know wrote their stacks you know 20 years ago, and now they put AI on their ticker, AI in their name, and because you know, and every company on the promenade it now says AI, even though you know they shipped their software in you know two, in, in 2003. So a lot of it is just fluff. Um, you know, I think like every big change, okay, like the internet, uh, like 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 the smartphone. I mean, we're going to see a proliferation of technologies. I mean, how many smartphones did we see before it came down to like two? Okay, and you know, how many smartphones did Microsoft release? Okay, uh, Motorola, uh, Nokia. I mean, where are they? They're gone, and Black we're down Mary. to like two. So we'll see a. You know, this is big, it's really big, and we're going to see a proliferation of a, you know, a thousand points of light, and then it'll con consolidate down to a few winners, just as it does in all other aspects of the information technology business. Um, what will characterize the winners? Um, people who deliver high quality products to deliver economic benefit to their customers. Hard stop. That's an e it's easy then, right? Hard stop. <laughs> Talk to us about just the your order book, your your financials, uh, how much will you earn over the next couple of years because of this boom you're talking about? Well, uh, we're anticipating significant growth. In other words, we have clearly seen in the last two or three years the interest in AI and enterprise AI that we've been working on for 15 years just kind of grow exponentially, right? I mean, there's nobody at Davos who isn't talking about AI. Um, so uh, we have today, I think, 58 tried, tested, proven enterprise application software products in the market today that handle everything from you know generative AI for Salesforce and generative AI for Workday to generative AI for manufacturing, supply chain, demand chain, and production optimization. So I think we're in a pretty good position to you know benefit from this interest, and we'd expect to see the, our growth rates grow considerably in the coming years. That said, just quickly, your last earnings report did disappoint the street to some extent. So when you go forward into this year, I don't know how much you can tell us given where you are in the reporting cadence, but you know what kind of, as you're looking into uh, the quarters that are coming, what kind of spending cadence do you expect from clients? Well, we changed our pricing model about eight quarters ago from a subscription-based pricing model to a consumption-based pricing model. And so for a short period of time, that depressed our growth rates and brought the stock price down. Now, you know, I'm not sure what happened last quarter, but last year, I think our stock price was up 156%. Yes. So, I mean, not bad. A Crimea River, okay? <laughs> and the, you know, so I think that, you know, that was pretty good. So we have seen, you know, in the last three quarters, our growth rates accelerating, and we'd expect to see, I mean, this enterprise application software market for enterprise AI applications is going to be huge. Um, our goal is to establish a market leadership position globally in that space. We might succeed at that, and if we don't succeed, we might be number two or three. Okay, any way you slice it, that's a hugely successful global 
you know, juggernaut. Before before we let you go, as I mentioned at the at the intro, you have one of the most viewed tickers on Yahoo Finance. People love trading your stock, re looking up into it and studying it. What do these folks need to know about you as a leader? Uh, we're focused on quality. We're focused on excellence. We're focused on innovation. We're focused on customer satisfaction. I mean, we're not the woke company. I mean, we're here for you know business ethics, high quality products, customer satisfaction, delivering economic benefit to our customers. Some of our customers generate you know. Actually, one customer has $2 billion in economic benefit from the use of our products last year. Another customer that's in the lumber and uh, uh, manufacturing business generates a $1 billion in economic benefit. Welcome back to our live coverage of the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. I'm Julie Hyman with Brian Sazi. And of course, we've been talking about all things AI to power a lot of that AI. We need semiconductors. That's not the only semiconductor news that we got today. However, TSMC, Taiwan Semiconductor, said revenues are going to grow as much as 25% this year. So here's someone to talk about all of this. That's Cristiano Amon of Qualcomm, the CEO there. Um, it's great to see you, Cristiano. First of all, you thank you so much for being here. Um, how, what is this signal, this TM, TSMC forecast, about demand, particularly for chips for smartphones, which is your bread and butter? Yeah, look, it's a great question. Um, I'll go back to our last earnings call that, uh, you know, for the first time, you know, 23 has been a year of correction in the industry for a number of reasons. The macroeconomic, we're coming off that 21, 22 supply chain crisis. There was a lot of demand. and But in the last earnings call, we said that a lot of the corrections were behind us, and we see signs of the, of the smartphone market normalizing it. So I can't really make predictions at this point about uh, how the year is going to uh, plan out, but I'm cautiously optimistic, especially on the Android side. We have seen last quarter the market normalize, and uh, you know, we, I think the TSMC sign is a very positive one. I know that um, phones are, are a good proxy of consumer confidence, you know, whether you're going to buy a new phone They're or pricey. not. Huh? They're pricey. Uh, they have a lot of technology okay, on there. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of AI phone around here. There's installations, there's demos all over the place. How is this new world of Gen AI going to impact your outlook for chips? Look, 
This is one of the most exciting things uh, for Qualcomm right now, especially when you combine that with what we're doing to diversify and grow the company. We have spent a lot of time creating this computing engines that you can run AI on the devices that are battery power at the edge, phone, PC, the AI PC, and cars. And, uh, and it's so exciting that you can actually, we did something which is very unique. We can run those large language models on your phone and you can do them very fast. Like we demonstrated with HN3 that just launched right now on Samsung Galaxy S24. I think they just had a, a great launch showing a number of new AI use cases running on the device. I think we're gonna see coming in uh, the second half this year, next generation Windows PCs with powered by X Elite that has a number of models running on the device. Actually, we, we have uh, uh, OpenAI Whisper model ported. We have over 40 different models ported into the device, and we're working on cars. So this is ex ex really exciting. I, If anything, I would say that's a great tailwind for the Qualcomm growth and diversification. Can you make enough chips to support this growth you're seeing? Because I hear this from you. I heard it from uh, Lisa Sue over at AMD. We've heard it from the NVIDIA team. I mean, how do you feed enough chips into this market? Oh, we don't. We don't have an issue. Maybe I should. I should talk about this in, in a different way. Um, in general, in general, I think, especially when you look at all the computation for AI and data center is a big piece of it right now. I think we will need a significant more capacity for manufacturing of chips. We even before what well, we saw the correction of the sector in 23. But the things we said before are still true. We're going to have to double the total capacity for manufacturing of chips before the end of the decade. And AI is just this new computation that has this huge demand for, for computing. And, you know, data center is going to go its own pace. I think what's exciting about what we're doing is we can do this on the devices, we can do this on phone, we can do this on PCs, we can do it on cars. And for that is we think that there's enough capacity those are very large industries and uh, right now we don't have we don't have a capacity problem but uh, demand could grow very very fast we're just the first uh, you know phase of a transition um, what's the number one question you're getting here about AI I mean as we said like every conversation we're having is about AI but you're in it so what's the question that you're getting from people yes um, it varies uh, one one big conversation is uh, you know uh, how can we go, uh, how can how this help my industry and what are the different use cases and there's an incredible amount of interest in getting that thing on the device. Just think about automotive as an example. Uh, natural language communication is perfect when you are behind the wheel and the car is now a new computing space. So how can we add those capabilities to some of the models, some that are in development with the existing hardware that we have. Those are like it's about use cases, how do we get faster? The other conversation is uh, how we should think about the impact that this technology has in the broader ecosystem. How do we keep the platforms open? How do we, how do we regulate this in a way that you regulate uh, for the guardrails they're necessary, but at the same time, don't prevent innovation, and most important, keep the platforms open. So, because you don't know, which model are going to be the model that wins. And it's going to be different models for different applications, and those needs to be available to run on all the platforms. Before we let you go, is there a new piece of AI that has changed your daily working life that you use all the time now? Well, I have been uh, uh, working with the Microsoft Copilot. It's very helpful, especially to summarize meetings, summarize uh, uh, chats and things like that. That has been useful. I've been experimenting with that. I think as a company, we're doing a lot of things with AI. We have been using AI to a lot of our development, how we uh, streamline access to information database. But I'm going to tell you something which I think it's not I'm using. I think that was a very cool thing. You, uh, Before we start, we're talking, you mentioned about CES. We had a very cool demo. Was CS. A lot of people found that was very interesting. We work with our partner BMW, and we got the information that you usually have in the glove compartment. You don't check, right? The manual, but also the service information that exists for a particular car model. You see something on the dashboard. You just ask your car, "What is that?" And the car will explain it to you. Will show you what's happening. Will tell you what to do. And a little light that always goes on. I never know what it is. Well, you're gonna know now. Well, and then it. we'll schedule this the service appointment for you.
think that uh, look, the media is talking about Nikki Haley, uh, but DeSantis has still been far better known uh, nationally, still is uh, polling uh, in second place. Uh, and uh, this is going to hurt Nikki. She was really trying to make the argument that it's a two-person race. It is not a two-person race. It's a one-person race. Uh, everybody else is essentially jockeying for cabinet positions and vice president under Trump if he wins. And that is, you know, where the country's going right now. What is the economic risk that you see if we do have uh, a rematch of, of Trump and Biden? Um, I don't think there's a, well, there's a, there's a near-term risk in the sense that once Trump gets the nomination, which is virtually certain, uh, that he will be so much more powerful in the Republican Party. I mean, overnight, he'll have the loyalty of pretty much everybody, the endorsements, the money, the media attention. And that means that his policy pronouncements, to the extent that he makes them, will suddenly have a lot more impact. For example, in pushing not to provide any support for the Ukrainians or in giving the Iranians a much tougher run in responding to their support for proxy wars in the region. Do I think that's going to have a big economic impact? Not near term. If Trump wins, of course, last time around there was a positive market impact to Trump winning. Why? Massive near-term deficit spending, markets like that, regulatory rollback, markets like that, uh, and also lower taxation. This time around, that would also be true, but it would be counterbalanced by so much of the concerns of American credibility, uh, even creditworthiness, around a U.S. that is so dysfunctional, so polarized, and where a new McCarthyism could emerge that would really chill red versus blue, including investability of red versus blue states under a Trump-led political administration. That wasn't a risk in 2016. That would be a risk in 2025. But is that a risk that would dissuade a President Trump from doing any of that stuff? No, of course not. So it could happen anyway? Of course. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, I am curious here in Davos, how many people are talking about the likelihood of a Trump presidency and, and sort of trying to prepare for that already? Uh, everyone's talking about it. I mean, there's a lot of ice out there <laughs> right under the ice, just under the ice, is sheer panic. Um, on the part of certainly every European leader. Mm. You may have seen Christine Lagarde, the head of the ECB, uh, who came out publicly saying that she thought that Trump was a, a, a serious uh, risk for Europe, for trade relations, for uh, America's role in the world. She's the only one that said that publicly. Every European leader I'm speaking to privately is concerned. I just had a meeting with a very senior Japanese delegation this morning. That was issue number one, two, and three. And they say, back in Tokyo right now, every CEO, that is what they're worried about. It's not yet dominating the media, but compared to the last two months ago when I was in Tokyo, it's become much more real. I think people were hoping that, you know, it can't really be real. I mean, given 91 indictments and given, you know, all of the legal exposure and the fact that in Washington, D.C., Trump could very easily be convicted before an election, something's going to happen to stop him. No, it's not. No, it's not. The only thing standing in the way of Trump winning is 81-year-old Joe Biden, um, who has a record to run on, uh, but also has a lot of people that feel like he's not actually up to the job. And that is a serious concern for a former president who refused to accept the free and fair transfer of power. I mean, that's existential. It's foundational to any democracy. In any well-functioning democracy, if you had this going on, this would be the number one, two, and three issue. And yet, in our country, it's not. What's the conclusion you take from that? It's that our democracy is not well-functioning. It is a democracy in crisis. And yes, that is the top issue being discussed at Davos this year. Well, Ian, I'm, I'm hearing you talk about Business leaders potentially pulling back and their level of concern. World leaders maybe not investing in the United States under another Trump presidency to the extent they would. It sounds awful for the U.S. economy. I didn't say that. I, I mean, the U.S. dollar is the global reserve currency. The U.S. is utterly dominant in artificial intelligence. It is a massive food producer exporter, a massive energy producer exporter. Higher production levels than Saudi Arabia right now only going up under Biden would only be going up under Trump. All of these are signs of economic strength. But at the same time, the political environment in the U.S. is is more dysfunctional by a long margin than any of the other advanced industrial democracies. No, to the extent this is a huge risk, I mean, yeah, red versus blue, concerns about creditworthiness long term, yes, that's true. But the bigger concern is for Europe. Of course it is. Because if you're the Europeans and, and you face a Trump who considers President Zelensky a personal and political enemy because he refused to go after Biden and Hunter when Trump demanded it, Trump has consistently said he's going to end the war in the first day. 
The way he does that is he says, here is the outcome that I demand that you accept which is completely unacceptable to the Ukrainian leadership. It's accepting essentially a partitioned Ukraine for a ceasefire. When that happens, he cuts off aid. Now, that will split NATO. That will split the EU. You've got the Poles and the Balts and the Nordic states who will be existentially opposed to U.S. policy, but you'll also have the Hungarians and the Serbs and maybe the Italians who will say, wait a second, we're paying a lot for this. Let's, let's work with Trump. Let's find a way to work with Russia. That's not the U.S. pulling out of NATO, but that's NATO fragmenting. That's the EU fragmenting. This is the biggest risk that the Europeans have seen since the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989. It is that big of a deal. And that's coming at a time when the Europeans are also paying far more for energy. They're having a real hard time continuing present levels of industrialization. They're facing significant fiscal challenges. And then you're going to throw Trump on top of that in the middle of a Russia-Ukraine war? We haven't talked about the Middle East. Right? This is, this is such a problem for the Europeans. Absolutely this is the top issue they're talking about right now. Ian, there's so much more I want to talk to you about, but I, I do have to ask about something we talked about off camera a little bit. And I said, as you were enumerating some of what's going on in the world, I said things are always sort of chaotic in the world. Unless people get sort of uh, apathetic or complacent, you said, no, it's not. This is worse. Yeah, this works. And so I just wanted to put a fine point on that in your view what is happening in the globe right now and why it is worse and why people need to pay attention. Because we have three wars going on right now. Uh, we have, and, and none of them have guardrails. None of them have diplomatic efforts to try to reduce or contain the tensions. Russia versus Ukraine, 83 countries getting together just a couple days ago in Davos went absolutely nowhere. The Russians not participating, the Chinese not participating. Uh, they're not gonna accept being partitioned, but that is the reality of where we're heading. Uh, you've got a Middle East war that continues to expand. It is not being contained to Gaza. The Americans are deeply isolated in their position supporting Netanyahu. That's not gonna change anytime soon. And then you have the US versus itself. And you have Democrats and Republicans that exist in different information spaces on everything, right? And that's a, it's not a civil war, but it's a very deep and existential fight among the, in the most powerful country in the world today. That, that is, we, we are used to that in the United States because it's been happening incrementally over decades and then a little more quickly over the last couple of years. But let us not kid ourselves about the unprecedented nature of what we're seeing in the U.S. political system virtually every day. We cannot normalize that. Our allies will not normalize that. Our adversaries will take advantage of that. That is what we're talking about here. Now, there are plenty of good things happening in the world. There's massive developments in AI and new climate transition. Energy technologies are becoming affordable at scale. The U.S.-China relationship a little better managed than it has been. India looks great right now. I mean, I can, we could do an entire segment just on the positive stuff, but you know, we've known each other for a while. Geopolitically, this is by far the worst environment in my lifetime.
Welcome back to Yahoo Finance and our coverage from the World Economic Forum in Davos. I'm Julie Hyman. This is Brian Sazi. And a lot of the conversations we've been having both on and off camera have been centered around AI, governance of AI, all the cool stuff AI can do. I even talked to a couple of folks off camera who said that they have a new AI-powered device, a generative AI-powered device called the Rabbit, which brings up the new sort of iPhone of AI race, if you will. Um, well, let's talk to somebody about all of this. Uh, Chairman and CEO of Verizon, Hans Vestberg, is joining us now. Thank you so much for being here, Hans. Thank you for having me. Good to be here. So Great to be here. When I think about sort of AI powered devices, obviously they need to run on something. Absolutely. So that help, makes me think of Verizon. Um, so, how are you thinking about what comes next and how Verizon plays in it? So when it comes to AI, I mean, uh, especially the generative AI and things like that, I, I think at the edge of the network it's going to be very important to have AI to take quick decisions very close to the, to the end user, the customer or the enterprise. Uh, and of course, that's how we built our network. We built our network with an enormously strong resilience from the data center to the edge of the network. Uh, so I think that as you're going to see over time, uh, the network will be very important. I mean, all the power you need for it, of course, to, to do all the generation of it, but also to transport all the data. And that's how we built the network. So very clearly, uh, we think the generative AI will be important for our, for our business. Uh, then, of course, we use AI already today in our in our company uh, and think that's going to be continue to be an important tool for us. As this AI permeates the United States, does that change how much you invest each year in terms of CapEx? No, not, not directly, but of course, over time, uh, the smarter you become to know where you're going to deploy your capital. Now we talk about network capital, how you build your network. I mean, in 2023, we have the guidance between 18 billion and a quarter to 19 billion and a quarter. So we invest quite heavily in capital intensive business. So if we would know you a little bit better where we have the uh, the, the holes we need to put in the cap, uh, ca, uh, capacity into quicker, that will be helpful from, from AI. Ultimately, I have a person doing it, but learning where do I have the challenges, where do I have the problems, that's very important. So definitely, it can make us much more efficient. Um, when you look at your business, I, I assume you guys are sort of device agnostic for end users on wireless devices, but I know you guys are trying to minimize churn at this point. You're trying to keep your wireless subscribers. Talk to us. I know you can't give us a lot of near-term discussion, but give us some big picture commentary No, because I'm going to report my fourth quarter I know, next week, so I, I will try to refrain from that. Yeah. No, I think you come to a market, if we talk wireless consumer, uh, almost everyone in this country has a mobile phone, so it's much about retention of the customers, continue to give them great services, and building new services. I mean, we have not only the greatest network, we also built a lot of new services, especially with the content providers we have. Uh, right now in the market, we have a combination of uh, Netflix and Max. Nobody else can do that. And ultimately, to give the right services and the right type of products. And we also launched my plan in May, where it's a, basically you customize your own plan. Mm. This is the type of network I want. This is the type of perks. We call it perks. What type? Of, I want Disney Plus. I want that. And you can put it together, and that becomes a more attractive offering. So that's how you need to think about it. Then, of course, there's also new customers that you want to attract. But as a smaller piece today, it's much more important to see that you have the right offering for the existing customers. The more tech CEOs, um that I talk to, I get the sense that I'm going to need a new phone very quickly. Do you see a major iPhone, Samsung upgrade cycle in the next couple of years because of this AI? We, we have seen, of course, uh, uh, a little bit of a slowdown on on, uh, on customers getting new phones, so they, they keep the phones longer because they're getting better and better, of course, that's part of it, and the network is, of course, even better. So, uh, But, of course, every new innovation attracts new uh, uh, players in the market and, and new devices. And I think the last time they were really hyped was, of course, when the first 5G phone came. Uh, in 2019, 20, and 21. Uh, let's see if AI have the same attraction. You're going to need to see, first of all, that it gives some new application services for the consumer, especially if they're going to attract them. So we are eager to see. I probably know more than I can say, but it's going to be exciting to see what type of phones will come out in the next couple of years. Well, yeah, kind of on a related note, I mean, we heard of, uh, one of your European competitors, Vodafone, coming out uh, with a new partnership with Microsoft today mm -hmm. that has to do with AI. Can we expect some things like that? from Verizon? 
I think we're already working with these type of things and I think that both because what you need to think about when you deliver a service to a customers you need a network to be configured right you need the devices and the modems that is making the connections right and you need the applications we are long term we work with our with our partners all the time to see that we have the best performance and the best innovative service on top of it so you can uh, you can not only expect we're already working with all these players in order to see that customer get the best of, of us and there's many different partners you need to work because we are agnostic for the different type of operating system and devices On Meta's last earnings conference call, CEO Mark Zuckerberg said that AI is going to change advertising in a big way. And we have the perfect person to talk about that, the head of the global business group at Meta, who's in charge of advertising, among other things. Great to see you. Nicola Mendelson is here with us in Davos. So Nicola, it's already changing advertising in many ways. So talk to us about what you're already seeing and what we may yet see in terms of the two. Okay, so back in 22, we brought together all of the products that we have that are actually powered by AI into our Meta Advantage suite. And what we're seeing now is that our advertisers on the whole are using at least one of those products. And the reason they're doing that is because it's giving them better targeting uh, and better performance. On average, they're seeing about a 32% increase in return on their advertising spend. So this is really significant. So this is where we are already today. We're going to continue to be investing to deliver stronger performance for our advertisers. But also when you start to think about generative AI, well, that's where we're really going to see some exciting changes. And we already are. So when it comes to, um, we, we launched last year a whole generative AI sandbox. And we're seeing our advertisers now starting to do image creation in there. We're starting to do image enhancement. We're starting to see uh, copy being done. And so this allows advertisers to do so much more uh, personalized marketing at scale, which I think is going to be very significant. Can, can you call the end to the ad recession that played out a lot last year? Well, I, you know, we're starting to see already that you know, the mood here this Davos is pretty similar to last year, which is there's a cautious optimism um, in the air. I think advertisers are getting more comfortable in uncertainty, and we're certainly living in very uncertain times. But ultimately, advertisers are going to advertise where they're getting strong performance. And with some of the numbers that I just shared with you, they're certainly seeing that from the meta suite of products. And what is sort of the balance of like between, I mean, there's obviously a lot of small advertisers across the meta platforms, but you also deal with a lot of the big advertisers 
customers. So what kind of differences are you seeing in demand between large and small companies? Actually, I mean, one of the things that I think is wonderful about Meta is in very much it's always been about the democratization of digital marketing. So it doesn't matter if you're the world's biggest advertiser or the world's smallest advertiser, you still have access to the same tools. And so they're using all of them. I mean, they really are enjoying the, uh, the Meta Advantage suite of products. It's really important. We're also seeing a big take up in Reels. Um, you know, three quarters of our advertisers, large and small, are actually using Reels now in their advertising. And that's not a surprise because we're seeing that people are really enjoying Reels. We're seeing hundreds of billions, 200 billion Reel plays a day and very high engagement. You know, we're seeing hundreds of millions of comments that are or shares that are actually happening. So we're seeing really deep engagement in that Reels product. And a lot of that, of course, is also powered by AI. And what about the uptake in terms of ads uh, for threads? Well, I knew you were going to ask me on that. So <laughs> we're very excited about um, the launch of Threads. You know, we, we shared that there's been 100 million people uh, utilizing it. We think they're really enjoying it. And, you know, it's actually far exceeded our expectations in terms of the take up. And we recently just launched it also in, uh, in Europe as well. But to your ads question, well, it's a little too early for that. You know, the way that we build products, I think you know this now, is that we really make sure that we get the engagement there with people and that they get there. That's what we did with Reels. That's what we did with Stories. And when we see that depth of engagement and the scale that we want to get it at, that's the point of which um, we'll bring in monetization. And I promise you, you'll be the first <laughs> I, to I, I know. I promise you, I will ask again. I, I know you, you will. <laughs>